Last episode, I talk about spectral classification and how there's O-type stars and G-type stars and K-type stars and M-type stars. And I mentioned in the video with this classification scheme that there's a very fundamental connection between type of star and what its surface temperature is, what its color is, what its radius range is, what its mass range is, how popular it is in the galaxy. And I mentioned that that connection between the type and the properties of the star only makes sense when the stars are in the prime of their life. And now I'd like to talk about what I mean by prime of their life. What is a star's main lifespan spent and what do we call that and why do we call it? Spoiler alert, we call it the main sequence. Here's the rest of the story. In the early 1900s, astronomers were trying to figure out everything just by staring at a whole bunch of stars and cataloging them and seeing if there were any interesting patterns or relationships or connections. And at first it was a big mess, and then it became an even bigger mess, and then we were able to add some labels to it, and it's still pretty messy today, but hey, we got labels to it. And one of the most important pieces of the puzzle is something called the Hertzsprung-Russell Diagram. This is like the Rosetta Stone for astronomy. The Hertzsprung Russell diagram was developed independently by Einar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell. And then they like, oh wow, we did the same thing. Cool. Yay for us. What this does is it plots uh, for each individual star, you record its surface temperature and you record its luminosity. Its luminosity is its, its, its true brightness. So, so stars on our sky have all sorts of different brightnesses. Sometimes stars are brighter because they're close, and sometimes stars are brighter because they're actually brighter. It's hard to tell because stars are all sorts of different distances from us, but once you uh, calculate their luminosity. Once you know their distance, you can assign like a true brightness to it. And we call that true brightness luminosity. So for every star, you record its true lo its luminosity, its true brightness, and its surface temperature. And you put a little dot on this diagram. And then you do another star and you put another little dot. And then another star, a little dot. Another star, a little dot. Another star. Little dot. And yes, they used to do this by hand. Dot, 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 and you see if there's any relationships among the populations of stars between their temperature and their brightness, and there is. There is a diagonal strip running along this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram where stars that are redder, which means they have cooler temperatures, tend to be less bright. They tend to be dimmer. And then stars that are hotter, which makes them look bluer, tend to be brighter. And there's this nice diagonal strip. Now, there are other regions in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which I'm going to talk about next week. This main diagonal strip is called the main sequence. It's called the main sequence. And when it was first invented, we actually didn't know like how stars actually worked. And we had thought that maybe stars start off as big and bright and then slowly over time compress, releasing their energy and then end their lives as small dim dwarfs. And so we thought maybe they start in the upper corner of this main sequence and then run down. Turns out that's completely backwards. But hey, those astronomers didn't know about nuclear fusion. So give them a break. Once we figured out this magic of nuclear fusion, we realized that this is how stars power themselves. And what happens in a main sequence lifetime is a star forms and it pops, it places itself somewhere on that main sequence. And then over time, as it evolves, it slowly creeps upward in both temperature and brightness. So that's exactly what our sun is doing now. The dinosaurs knew a slightly smaller, slightly dimmer, slightly weaker star. And our distant um, descendants, you know, if, if they're still around, will experience an even hotter, brighter sun. Once stars 
end their evolution and begin their final life stages. They leave the main sequence and start to explore other regions of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. But while they are burning hydrogen, while hydrogen is their primary fuel source for the fusion happening in their cores, they will live on this main sequence. And different mass stars enter at different parts of the main sequence. So like a, a small star will enter the main sequence as a dim red dwarf. A giant star will enter the main sequence as like a bright blue O-type star. But no matter where they land on that diagonal strip, they will crawl along on it as long as they are burning hydrogen and then they, they will leave. And since the vast majority of stars spend the vast majority of their lifetimes burning hydrogen, the vast majority of stars that we see will exist on the main sequence. So they will leave the main sequence eventually, <clears throat> but while they are burning hydrogen, they will live on that main sequence. And while they're on the main sequence, we can make the connection between their spectral type, like O-type, K-type, M-type, and their temperature and the luminosity. And it's the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that makes it possible. That is the magic of astronomy. There it is. <clears throat> you don't need to do or learn anything else in astronomy. That's it. That's it. I will see you next time when I talk about what happens when stars do leave the main sequence. In the meantime, please visit patreon.com slash pmsutter, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next week.